All right, so today's uh, chapter was on chapter 12, which is on model tuning and the dangers of overfitting. Uh, this chapter, I guess, is more or less a setup chapter for, I guess, the next couple of chapters later on. Um, so it's uh, written and will be presented at a pretty high level. Uh, mainly, it talks about, um, it's sort of the introduction to the tune and dials package. So, and we'll sort of talk about how that plays a role into uh, fitting these machine learning models. Um, one thing that I am not um, entirely sure of, um, mainly because I, I don't actually use tidy models in my day to day at the moment, um, is how it starts to fit into the whole workflow system. Um, I'm a little bit not totally sure how that works. I mean, I can read the code and understand it, uh, but in terms of like writing it from scratch, I'm sort of like, yeah, on it. So, um, so the first thing, uh, what is a tuning parameter? Um, so if we compare models that can be solved through math, uh, for example, fitting a linear regression model, um, you can do a closed form solution um, just through linear algebra, like why, essentially like finding out the B and Y equals MX plus B, um, you can solve that and you can solve B, uh, solve for B uh, given a set of data. Um, so that's not where tuning parameters come in. Um, tuning parameters come in for models where something is not, uh, there isn't a fixed closed form solution. Um, so here are some examples like in machine learning, if you're doing a uh, boosting of trees, which is taking one sort of random forest kind of cart tree and then finding the results from that and then rerunning it with um, slightly different weights. Um, the number of times you do that is gonna be it's sort of like up to the user. There's no closed form solution to say like, hey, you have to pick five or you have to pick 10 or it's not really you have to pick. It's like the answer is five, right? Um, so picking the number of trees and boosting is one thing. In artificial neural networks, we've you almost see like that almost meme diagram of like three circles goes to five circles, goes to three circles, goes to one circle and a whole bunch of lines connecting through them for um, artificial uh, neural networks. Well, that the the number of circles or nodes um, or neurons in a neural network is sort of up to the user to figure out. And so that is another value that needs to be changed and there's no solution for that. Um, you just have to try it. Um, a lot of these methods, uh, because there is no closed form solution, um, we have some kind of thing that we want to um, explore like this, imaginary space that we need to explore. And so a lot of one very efficient way of doing that is called gradient descent, which is how do we feed the, how do we find the maximum or minimum of a, of some space? Well, let's just sample a whole bunch of spaces. And then if essentially, if the derivative is positive, negative, or zero, we'll know that if we're going up a hill, down a hill, or for flat on a hill or something. Um, so with gradient descent, you have to know how big your steps are, how many actual steps you're gonna take. That's something that you would have to tune. Uh, with random forests, you have number of predictors, number of trees, a number of data points. These all are types of models where like they're, they're, the user has some leeway or the user might know something to, um, to modify the value. Uh, same thing with pre-processing, so PCA, um, KNN, or uh, these are all types of like a lot of these unsupervised clustering uh, models are going to have some kind of tuning parameter because you don't, um, by, by definition, you don't know what the actual solution is, so you're trying to figure something out, so you're going to end up trying to tweak a value. And all of these values that you tweak are known as a tuning parameter or also known as a hyperparameter. Uh, from the statistics world, there are things that you can change. Uh, so the, the biggest thing um, 
that sort of like I understand really um, is all of the general linear models, especially with binary outcomes. So we usually think of uh, logistic regression, uh, but logistic regression actually comes from the logit function. Um, and so there's other functions that change the input data and how it relates to the output data. Essentially, that's a very simplified way of describing it, uh, like probit or logit or um, et cetera. Those link functions are something that you as a user can modify. So a tuning parameter doesn't always have to be like a number. It can actually just be a full blown function. And essentially it just points to the fact that there are things that the user can modify and there's no set solution for. Um, the chapter also talks about things where you don't want to tune. So things like uh, prior dis priors in Bayesian analysis. So in Bayesian analysis, you have a, let's say a column and let's call it like age of your patients or something. If you look at the histogram of, some, of that, it's gonna follow some distribution. You as the analyst will pick a distribution that matches the distribution in your data and that's more or less fixed. Um, you don't go trying out different priors or different versions of that uh, that fits your the data that you have because it's really the data that you have. There isn't really tuning uh, for that. Um, things like uh, random forest for like the actual number of trees, you just need it to be big enough so that the random forest results are um, pretty stable. And so it's like, I think like for random forest, it's like you create like 500 trees or something. And it's just like some big number and you don't really tune that. Um, it's more of like, it needs to be as big. So the values are numerically stable. Um, so those are like things that yes, the user has control over, but no, that doesn't play in to the actual model fitting portion. Um, so that is sort of like the subtle detail between like what is a hyperparameter, like something that you should uh, change. Um, not all hyperparameters are things that, um, actually these are all hyperparameters, but not all hyperparameters are things that you need to like tune and refine. Um, so the example that they go through, um, so this example that was written by the r ds folks is slightly different from the uh, example that's in the book, but they're essentially trying to say like, okay, so here is a mock data set. We have year and sales price. Um, can we fit a model that can uh, accurately distinguish whether or not there's central air in that house, right? So no, the red means no, and the green, uh, the blue means yes. And if you look at this and you sort of squint your eyes, like maybe like a really small line around like this lower left-hand portion of the plot is probably your, going to be your uh, line to distinguish whether or not a house has um, central air or not. And so now the question is, okay, we want to figure out if a house is yes or no uh, with central air because it's a binary variable. There's only two values. Um, very commonly, we use one of the logistic regression models, right? Like that is a pretty good first step. Um, if you if you look at Kaggle, everyone just throws XG boost into everything. But if we're thinking about this sensibly, like, okay, maybe logistic regression. So like I just mentioned, like that logistic regression there's a couple of what's known as link functions. So if it's logistic regression, you're using the logit link function. If it's a probit, I think it's called probit regression or whatever. Uh, it's all part of the GLM binary um, family of functions. So there's a probit link and a um, complementary log log link. And so, yeah, you can change that, that we mentioned that those are things that you're allowed to change as a data analyst. Um, so if we just look at um, how well does the model work um, right here? Uh, because the log link is the smallest, we might say like, hey, the logit or logistic regression is probably the best model to fit this data. Um, but we now want to think about model, uh, what's known as um, model metrics. Like, okay, so just because we have this one value, how do we know this model is actually like good or not? Um, how do we know that this model is actually good for new data points? Um, it's not really a good idea to compare the model 
uh, to its own fitted data. You, like most of the time, we want to figure out if the model is predictive of something. And so we have this uh, complementary or clashing set of there are metrics um, that can essentially figure out or give you some number that represents like how, um, what is the actual term? Uh, done. Uh, ba -ba I will probably end up stumbling to that term like in a little bit, but if we look at this plot, they plotted the uh, log likelihood and the area under the curve. Um, the area under the curve is one way to spec uh, to distinguish specificity and sensitivity, and I have to like think about what the actual differences are. But it's a it's a way of trying to balance like how good is this um, to like roughly new data. Um, that's sort of like a very simplified way of uh, describing that. But the main point here is if you draw those models, you'll notice that like all three of those lines are pretty much the same. Um, and so if we look at log likelihood, it would essentially say like, hey, um, so this is different from the statistic that's up here. But if we look at log likelihood, like, hey, logistic regression is the best model here. But if you plot the lines, you'll notice that like those lines don't really like, they're essentially the same. Um, and if you look at area under a curve, it's going to tell you, yeah, they're, they're essentially the same, right? So there is some discrepancy between like, hey, if we just look at one statistical, um, what is it like, uh, models, parameter, um, it's not going to be able to tell you the entire story. And so now we have this uh, thing of like, okay, we have all of these hyperparameters that we want to tune. Um, how do we go about fitting or figuring out what those hyperparameters are, right? There's, it's again, by definition, it's not just one value that we can just calculate and that's the correct answer, we have to figure it out. And so you have this balance between underfitting to overfitting, which is uh, essentially what this chapter is trying to um, introduce. And so here's an example um, in regression, which is essentially fit a line or fit a model that describes your data. This is a set of points that essentially looks like a little uh, parabola. So if we draw a straight line, that's not exactly the proper model to use. Something that is parabolic is the thing to do, but you can go too far and connect all your dots, uh, which is not what you want to do uh, because it won't behave well to new data. It'll perfectly and accurately predict your current data, but nothing new. And all of machine learning, uh, all of these predictive models really um, are all about how well can predict a brand new data point. Same with um, classification. Instead of fitting a line to figure out what that point is, it's trying to draw a boundary of like a class. So circles or X's, um, what is the line that can distinguish them? Um, like our example before, what are the houses that have air conditioning units, uh, central air, yes or no? It's trying to draw that boundary to figure out where the, uh, what are factors related to um, air conditioning units. And so there's a couple of tuning, uh, there are a couple of methods to figure out what the hyperparameter could be. And these methods are what the next couple of chapters are about. Um, so if I say this um, is a parameter, um, there are two values that can go from zero to one. Um, one simple way is to do what's known as a grid search or specifically a spaced filled grid, which essentially means let's take an equal amount of points and spread them out as far as apart from one another and you get a grid. And now that we have a grid, let's use every bit of those combinations to plug into our model and then see how our model performs. And you can see here, this is a good way of, um, let's say like this blue circle bit here, um, that is like our quote unquote most optimal pair of hyperparameters. You can see like we'll have one, two, three, four values that will pretty much get us there. It won't get us the, the absolute best value, but it's essentially close enough and definitely within like error bounds, um, like the confidence interval of the most optimal solution. But you can see here, there's like a lot of points and here in the top right corner, there's a lot of points that don't even matter. And so 
you can compare that to like, okay, a random search, which we won't really cover later on, but a random search instead of something that's evenly spaced out, let's do a random space out. And that's mainly because um, these are different ways of reducing the number of points that you would need to test. And that is because um, this is only two parameters from zero to one with like one with I think like 10 points in each grid, but you can see like if this was a continuous thing um, from zero to infinity, like what are the numbers that you need to pick? Um, or from zero to one, these are two points. Uh, what if we had more hyperparameters um, that we need to tune? This can end up taking a bunch of time, um, especially if one of these things takes like the computer, like let's say a minute to run, you can see here, this is almost like an hour's worth of runtime. Um, so randomly picking from the grid is one way to get um, a sense of what's going on. Um, you might get lucky and get something closer to the center. Uh, you might have fewer points um, in the outliers, um, in a part that don't matter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we can be a little bit smart about that. And this is another place where gradient descent comes in or gradient ascent, however you're looking at it. Um, is this iterative search, which Let's start somewhere random. So that's somewhere that you might have to tune and pick, like you randomly start somewhere. And then you follow like that ascent or descent algorithm to figure out what is the most optimal point. And you can see like, for the most part, we get a lot of points closest to the place that we wanna be. And that's uh, what's great about this iterative, like ascent uh, related um, search. But there are a few things that um, might not be useful. So here, this, like I said before, gradient descent requires a couple of hyperparameters. You need to tell it where to start, yes. You need to tell it how big these steps are, like from here to there. Each one of these Xs, how far can it go? Um, so that's one thing that you have to keep in mind as well. And you can see here, like probably there's a lot of points around that center, but we didn't really need all of those points. Um, because a lot of it is, again, if we go back up here, like, you know, these four points were close enough. These 20 points here are all essentially close enough, right? So you have a lot of overlap in when you do these iterative searches of like, there's going to be a point where like, yeah, you're running your model for an hour, but really like how much better are you doing in the last like 30 minutes? Because all of these points are going to be essentially like the same model. Like, yeah, the, the weights are going to be a little bit different, um, but they're essentially all on top of each other. And like, that's the problem with iterative search. It's because you don't know if this is like the actual peak or valley of something. Like you have to like just run all of these neighboring points to figure out like you're actually there. Um, and so that's one of the other trade-offs. Um, so how do we go about tuning these parameters or essentially like figuring out or having the tidy models ecosystem um, automatically pick these numbers for us? Um, that's sort of where the dials and tunes library come in. And so when you're dealing with these methods, there's two things that we want to keep in mind. Um, so the example that they go through is using random forest. So in random forest, there is going to be a, how many trees are you going to, um, sorry. Is that how many trees? Yes. I think how many trees is something that you pick, um, how deep the trees are. Um, those are things that like every, essentially every random forest algorithm um, has. So those are like what's whoops. Those are what's known as whoops. The main arguments, and so um, this is sort of why like tidy models is pretty uh, hard to put in a a new model. It's because they have to consider like what are the ones that are in that class of models. And then there's something called engine specific. Like every person who's writing a random forest algorithm is making some kind of decision in how the algorithm works. And so um, some of these developers allow you to change um, those like really small details. And so there are engine specific uh, random forest algorithms, uh, parameters. And so um, I guess the folks at Tidy Models are really Max Green, really likes the Ranger package for Random Forest. And so there are Ranger specific 
uh, parameters that you can put put in, as well as the generic random forest uh, set of parameters. And they're all like in the tidy models, like model page for each model. Like there's a list of like, okay, this ranger is part of the random forest ecosystem. Here are the random forest parameters. Here are the ranger specific ones. And so that's another thing that sort of makes these um workflow things sort of like more complex is because like now you have to go figure out like what is function specific what is like implementation specific and what is just like this is just a model specific thing and so let's look at an example here if we have a regular recipe so recipe is how the actual model with the columns that we want to use with the actual data set and then we can go and from the previous chapters like go through the process of you know, taking these different steps to feature select, but uh, feature engineer, but we're not really going through that process right now. But here's an actual recipe. We can then, um, on the side, create a actual model specification. So this is how this plugs into the previous chapters about how workflows work. So we specify like, okay, this is the data, this is the model, like that's how we all plug into the workflow. So this is the model. You can see here, we are specifying random forest. We have to set the engine, like what is the actual light? Essentially think of it as like random forest isn't a, I mean, random forest itself is actually called, there is a library called random forest, but random forest is the function that we wanna use, which library that implements random forest we want. And so here we're using Ranger as the library. Um, and then in here, we're setting it to regression mode, like um, give me like some continuous variable instead of um, classification mode where we're trying to predict between two classes. The nice thing is we can run args to give us the actual arguments uh, for this model object. Um, so for random forest, so this is the actual um, trying to think. Yeah. So when we are using random forest from um, tidy models, it'll tell us like, hey, these are the bits and pieces. Is that right? Yeah. These are the bits and pieces that you can tweak. And then here you can see the engine by default is set to Ranger, but we can manually specify Ranger. Um, if you want to look at the engine specific arguments, you can directly look at the Ranger function itself and pull out the engine specific um, uh, parameters. And I guess this is one of those things that just like takes time to figure out like where you put things, but that's sort of the nature of learning a, a new framework. So in previous chapters, if we were to run a model, we can simply say number of tries, number of trees, uh, minimum number, et cetera. Um, we can put that in directly. How the dials package work is instead of putting a number in there, we simply put in tune, like tune the function. Uh, tune the function is a function from dials and it, when it tries to, it doesn't, evaluate to any number. It just evaluates to this expression called tune. When you plug it in into these workflow um, functions, it's going to understand like, oh, I can't just run it like this. It knows how to sort of go off and like pick a value from a, a tuning grid or something. And so the actual, um, this part is roughly the same from previous chapters. The only thing that we need to do as if we're trying to try different things is putting together this tune function and it's literally just tune. And then we can get um, all of these parameters. And so tidy models understands when we put in tune and we use parameters for this entire model, it will understand like what the ranges for those things can be, right? And that's why like tidy models is just, it's not as simple like, can you implement my function in your framework? It's because it's gonna have to understand like, hey, if someone puts tune in here, what is the proper set of potential values, right? Like, so what's nice is you as the user, you don't have to know that the this value goes from zero to one or zero to infinity, right? Like dials will know uh, how to handle that essentially. I believe that's how that works, yeah. And so the next question is, um, how do we go about an updating? Uh, 
Uh, actually, it. Yeah, so it does understand um, what the range is. So it's going to say like, hey, this goes from zero to something. What you can do is you can take your model already and you don't have to rerun the code. Uh, what you can do is say like, okay, I ran some model. Um, let me run it again with a different set of values or a different set of uh, ranges. So instead of rerunning your code all over again, you can simply say update. Um, you can pipe it into update and then it's going to collect a new set of parameters. And so that's a really nice way to do um, iterative uh, machine learning as you're trying to figure out like what the optimal values are. And so that's sort of the thing that's sort of tricky with tidy models is yes, it, it can give you a single model um, that is the most optimal for whatever you're looking at. Uh, but it, but it also has all these tools where you can like go explore and figure stuff out to figure out what that optimal model is. And so that's sort of like where this thing in my head, like it bifurcates, um, where like you still have the ability and there's still a bunch of all of these other functions to help you update your model without having to rerun your model or re-put in a new set of values, which is nice because you can essentially store all of these updated tries. And then, you know, if you're at like your 10th iteration, you can even, you can really essentially go back and like compare all of your 10 um, iterations. Um, so it's really useful if you're like, you know, you're spending an entire day trying to fit a model, you can look at all of the models you fit that day. Um, what, so we can pipe, how does this all go in when we're trying to create a workflow? So we create the workflow object, we put in the, um, the actual uh, model that we want. So this includes everything that's updated, et cetera, et cetera, uh, with the tune parameters. We tell it what is the um, recipe, which includes all of the, uh, feature engineered uh, things that we've done. Uh, so that's all chapter, all the way up to chapters from four to nine. Mm -hmm. And then we can say like, hey, um, here is, uh, we actually, uh, now that I'm looking at this, hold on. I uh, don't remember what parameters does. I have to check what parameters is doing. Um, I think it was the the parameters that are uh, to the parameters that, that that fit into the tune function that you put in um, right here. Yeah, um, and then you can just say like go run all of them, and then. Um, essentially it just says, go run all of them in this workflow. That's essentially what it's trying to do. Because at the end of the day, you want a model run for each one of those parameters that we're trying to figure out. And then for each of those models, there's some collection of model metrics that you want. So you can compare them to one another to figure out which is the best model. So um, this finalized is sort of like doing the actual work of fitting everything and saying like, hey, go run everything. Are you sure about that? Uh, Is that not so what it's here doing? it says that you can use finalize if the if the range of the tuning is depending dependent on the data. So for example, uh, depending on how many variables you have, you can have a maximum number of variables in each tree or something like that. And I and I'm trying to think like I but I think finalize is actually what kicks off the calculation. It, it, it might be. I, I yeah, because I think if you run it up to here, I don't think anything runs. Uh, very similar to like when you run like group by on a on a data frame, it's like instantaneous because it like it didn't actually run a calculation yet. So my understanding was that finalize calculates the possible ranges for the parameters that you are going to tune, but the actual tuning doesn't happen yet. 
or maybe we should try it. Oh, right oh okay. Hold on. Yeah, we might need to try that out. Um, I might have understood that incorrectly. Give me one second. So here's a sentence on the screen that with the finalized function, M try was completed based on the number of predictors in the training data set. So I think in the in the in, in this whole chapter we we haven't fitted a model yet. Uh, that is correct. In this whole chapter, we have not fitted the model. Um, oh, okay. Maybe that's why I was so confused with workflow. Um, that could be why I was super confused with workflow. Okay. So let me backtrack that. Um, we have this range of possible values. Um, so I think in our current example, um, in random forest, we have how many tries the uh, so m try uh, min n and this regularization factor. Um, these are things that we want our model to essentially go through a bunch of values and figure it out. Um, when we ran update. We also here said like, hey, instead of going from one to whatever the default that you might end up figuring out, like actually just go from one to four and not just keep going because it can't go to infinity. Um, so we can update that. Um, and so all of that ends up creating a grid of possible combinations for everything. And then finalize is plugging those values into the model that we're going to fit, but we haven't fitted a model yet. And that makes sense. It's it's all into this variable called updated params. Right, okay, so that makes sense. That's why that's this part of the workflow. Um, so we have all of these combinations of all of the numbers that we're going to fit into and plug into our model, uh, but we haven't actually gone about uh, running the model yet. And then in the next couple of chapters, which is grid search and iterative search, is um, you said to go uh, from this place to this place, um, this range to this range. Um, maybe like for something like M try, you can do one, two, three, and four. But if it's something from like zero to one, you might have to specify um, either if you're doing a grid search, like, hey, I want 10 spaces between zero and one, or you can say, hey, go iteratively, go figure it out. Um, try things that are near you and then find the one that is quote unquote better. Um, and then the book also points and points to other libraries uh, like Yardstick. So Yardstick is like an actual Yardstick or meter stick, um, a unit of measure and the Yardstick package tries to measure like how well a model is performing. And so in the yardstick package, you have stuff like MS, R, RMSEA or like R squared and all of those calculations for all of these different models. Um, yardstick understands that and you can use that when you create like this entire grid of models to figure out what is the actual set of hyperparameters you want to pick. You as a human don't need to figure out what is the quote unquote best one because of workflows and because of this part here that we're talking about today, um, it can figure out the most optimal set of numbers in your hyper tuning grid for you. Um, so this is sort of how all, all of these tidy model packages like fit into one another to like essentially automate these things away for you. Um, but it still helps to like understand what's going on under the, the general concepts of what's going on. Um, and that's sort of like, I am also uh, pretty new to tidy models. So like at some, usually when I end up fitting a model, I'll, I'll end up somewhere around here and then I end up doing my own grid and then I leave tidy models because I have no idea what's going on anymore. <laughs> um, there's so much of um, these iterations that are doing like all of these more high level complex tasks that sometimes I, uh, because I'm new to this library, it's like a little bit easier to drop into like 
the quote unquote old way of doing things. Um, so that's sort of uh, where my limitations are and how I'm usually working through uh, model fitting. But I guess these couple of days, I'm not actually fitting models. So it ends up being harder to um, practice a lot of this stuff. So I have right. a question. Can yeah. you go back one slide? So in the, uh, to the point of finalize is it is what it's doing is it's defining that unknown range, right? When yeah. So finalize. it's like doing this update thing. It's like doing update, but it's like you go figure it out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So that min and value, like it has a range from two to 40 while the other one has like one to unknown. And so I, so if I understand correctly, the finalize is specifying the range that is unknown. Um, or so, yes. So you go through the yes. workflow and then you finalize and then it gives you, it, it's, you're asking it to give you that range that is unknown. Yes. Yes. Okay. And it's trying to figure out, or it's trying to give you, it's, it is trying to do a sensible, it's trying to figure out a sensible number for you. So like, yeah, this can go to, you can just tell the computer to try forever and that doesn't make sense. Um, so it's trying to figure out like something sensible. Um, so if you were like in theory, you can leave all of this blank and it will at least be able to plug in the numbers to give you a model that fits and it won't like error out with like, you need to specify this. Um, so it's trying its best to like, give you sensible defaults. Okay. And I know Max in the actual chat talks about that a lot where um, they're trying to get things working out of the box as easy as possible. Um, so I think like if you watch the sliced competition, like for XG boost, there's like a parameter, like a learning rate parameter that um, by default is set a little bit too high and everyone just ends up like dropping it to something really small. So like, it's like, oh yeah, when we do XG boost in tidy models, let's just default it down to like 0 0.2 or something instead of like by default, it's like 0 0.9 or 0 0.8 or one. Um, so um, it's trying to figure that out for you. And so it's like, yeah, if someone, anyone were to just randomly try to fit a model, let's try to get them the best model we can um assuming they don't know anything about statistics uh, which is you know sort of dangerous um why are you fitting a model if you don't know what's going on but um that's sort of what they're trying to prevent or guard against all right Quest questions <laughs> So uh, the essence of the dials package is like knowing which parameter has which which range, which is sensible for it. Am, am I right? Um, so yeah. So the dials. So I guess it's like one of the nice things when they're trying to name these things. It's like okay, here here's a model with a whole bunch of like literal dials that you can tune. Um, so we're using dials to um, figure out what those numbers are, and then the tuning is trying to figure out what what numbers we should pick. So yeah, it's trying to figure out um, what are the um, list of possible values for each number. Yeah. Which in yeah, some it's, sense it's is like bit, super cool. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, um, go. No, you sorry. Go. No, I was just saying it, it's a bit hard to, it's a bit hard to understand without seeing the whole process together for me. So we, as you said, we didn't see fitting yet. And, yeah. and actually, yeah, I think that's actually what tuning the parameters. So it's. 
think that's what threw me off when I was like copying and pasting everything, yeah. <laughs> running things. I was like, I usually personally, I don't end up well, because I learned how to fit models before tidy models um, was created. So like, yeah, before you would like literally like do here's a list of values for this. Here's a list of values for this, like literally Cartesian product your way through and then for loop somehow into like parallel processes go fit your model with these set of values um, and then bring it all back and calculate this set of uh, model statistics. Um, that's what I'm used to seeing. Um, I guess everything that I presented today was creating that initial set of like values that we would go and plug into a model. And the, and there's more, I guess like next week or whatever, the next two chapters is literally about what are those values that we would go about picking? So like grid search, I guess, is like the easiest. And usually this is what I end up doing um, in the past, which was like, hey, this thing can take like values from zero to one. I want 10 of these because I only want to run 50 models um, and just go like evenly spaced out values and go figure it out. And then what people end up doing is like once they find like part of the grid that is like roughly doing well, then they'll do something more specific um, to figure out like the most optimal um, set of values. So that's um, that's something that they also mentioned in this chapter. Um, you can use grid and iterative search together um, just to help you run your models a little bit faster. So like run grid search first because you can get fewer number of points just to figure out like where is a good place to start. And then once you figure out a good starting place, you can do iterative search so you don't have to like worry about going, um, going into a part of your picking a set that is like, um, you don't have to worry about like it going all over the place or starting from a really not um, optimal place and just takes forever to get you a good solution. Yeah. That's a lot or for the presentation? Uh, yeah, and it, it's it's to the point where um, because I personally don't work in workflows or workflow sets <laughs> um, on a day-to-day, -day, it's like this is, everything is built around plugging into workflows now. Um, and so it's like, a little bit more uh, complex. Um, and I, I kind of wonder um, at the start of this chapter, like this block, like from chapter 10, um, I wonder if it's like, um, you know how like, I, I don't know if you know, but like in the in the R packages book, like that first chapter, they just like literally tell you like, this is the whole thing, um, like the whole entire workflow of what everything looks like or a setup in R package. And it's really great as a, as a reference. Um, let's see if I can pull it up. Yeah, so like the R packages book, like right here, like after introduction of like why you want want to write a package or whatever, this chapter here literally like is a reference for like, hey, you can read the whole book if you want, or you can literally just follow these steps and you'll get like a R package. Um, I wonder if it's like at this point, right before we went into like the last couple of weeks of talking about things, like have some version of the whole game using like workflow sets and everything just so like, mm -hmm as we're reading into more details, like we, we have something that works that we can point back to and be like, oh, we're at that part of the, um, the actual, actual thing. Cause um, yeah, it worked the whole workflow sets thing and workflow is sort of like, I don't really use this <laughs> um, and it gets hard. Um, yeah, there's a hand. We still can't hear you.
or or you can type it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think something like setting up the whole game would be like maybe useful, like right even like before the entire book, just so like um, there is a reference somewhere. And I guess like if we go back, I'm pretty sure if we, well, I guess they haven't gotten to <laughs> ensemble methods uh, models yet, but um, yeah, I think it would be useful if they, for example, did a, you know, setting up random, um, yeah, uh, random forest and regular linear regression and just doing ensemble on that is probably enough of a complicated use case example where like most people are trying to compare multiple models and just, going through the process of like picking two values for a couple of random forest things, leaving linear regression stuff alone, um, and just going through like one or two pre-processing steps and how that all fits in, I think would be pretty useful um, as a um, as an example. Um, I guess someone can put that together. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think it'll be pretty useful and maybe it's something like you can bring up to the actual um, uh, rest of the group, um, like some reference part of the entire thing. Um, so people have like, can reorient themselves. Uh, so there was a question about regularization factor. Okay. Uh, I think, hold on. I think it was here. Okay. So So I, from my reading of this, um, so regularization in general is a term used to balance or penalize if you start putting more variables into a model, um, start putting a penalty off of just the fact that you have 100 variables, you might have like a slight increase in some model metric compared to like, 10 or 99. And so this is a set of values that we can use to, to see like, hey, if you start putting in more um, yeah, if you start using like more of um, what is it? It's actually for what did they call gain? I'm trying to remember, like, there is a, I know in a lot of these like machine learning methods, like there is like this notion of like information gain. And I think like random forest, like every split into the tree is like split off of some kind of like, model of like some kind of uh, function. Like for example, you can pick like a G Gini function is like one really common one or variance is another common one. Um, and my understanding is it's sort of like penalizing that um, somehow based off of like the number of um, I want to assume like the number of variables being considered or something. Um, my only 
analogy in my head it's really similar to like um lasso or ridge regression or really elastic net where you literally have a value where you're just saying like hey if these things are just not being useful like throw them out <laughs> because they're not useful uh variables and it's like penalizing like those extra variables that you're throwing in that is maybe um, uh, can you... yes um, we can so... hear you uh, great. Um, so if you uh, can go back to the book, uh, the, the original one, uh, yeah. the, uh, so the 12.6 section, uh, the, the chapter summary, mm -hmm. then uh, some point, uh, before just just right before the chapter summary um there is a, the regularization factor and uh, right above there is a like a bit of a chunk of code uh with the model can you i don't know if you can um start with principal components the recipe of the principal components uh that, that oh, oh, oh 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 yep 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 Okay. Um, okay. Above, there's a recipe. Uh, then the, the calculation of the principal components, and then all together in a workflow. The model mm -hmm. is uh, it's a random forest model, uh, which uh, the principal component uh, uh, data is uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I have this, this workflow, uh, which is um, assigned to a variable updated param. So this updated param then uh, is used to pull it out, pull, pull up the, the object uh, out to... To give you the set of values to, that it's going to try. Okay. And what is the regularization factor? Because if you go just a bit if down, down you have the, yeah. there is the uh, regularization factor. Which, oh, that is a straight up function. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that is which, different. Okay, so that is different from what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> um, no, oh, yeah, that's just, not a... I think the dials package has a function for each parameter that it can tune. And this function tells you the, I think the default range for, for tuning that parameter. That's my understanding. At, 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 at least when we, when we updated the tuning parameters, then we use the similar function for, for what we updated. Yeah, I think it's the same thing as typing and try uh, bracket bracket. It's just giving you the range that it's going to tune on. And then it's like normalizing the, the range to zero to one, from zero to one. Yeah, so if I do this, um, console, it's the same thing. It's just giving you the specs of the of the tuning parameter. It's going to give some value between zero and one for the regularization factor, which is the something we're going to tune uh, using whatever grid search. Grid search. Okay. Uh, I have a question, actually, Daniel. Um, do we have to? Give the ID when when we're setting a tuning parameter, like we did with regularization factor. I don't know. Um, you mean like, for example, comparing this? Yeah. So like in cold dials object. Um, yeah, I'm looking. So I everything I said about regularization before was in context of something else. Uh, <laughs> Um, like it's I necessary. have no idea how this function works. <laughs> um, 
because I think I think the book mentioned that you too. only need to specify an, an, an ID if you have maybe uh, two different tuning parameters with the same name. So it can happen oh. with, because different packages might have or different models. So different packages might have the same same parameter that you can tune. So, so, yeah, so it's not necessary. Yeah, because that regulation regularization dot factor, that is literally the parameter in Ranger. And so that's why it's written like that. Um, so that that's what I originally thought regularization factor meant. Um, well, the question was referring to this regularization factor. I am not sure how it's really working under the hood. Um, my guess is for every engine, regularization underscore factor understands what is the parameter it needs to figure out. Because I guess in every model, there's only one regularization factor, um, if that does exist, but I am not sure. Um, but yeah, so there is like regularization dot factor, which is the actual parameter in Ranger. And then there's regularization under fact, underscore factor, which is a uh, dials package function. I'll just say tidy uh, models because I have no idea where it's coming from at the moment. Oh, yeah, it's coming from dials. Um, it's a dials function which then points to like that block of text that you uh, described, but that's not really like informative of like how it's figuring out like what thing to, um, how it how it knows um, its regularization dot factor. Um, I believe it has to do with like the tune when you pass in reg, but um, I guess you can put in like another set of functions in there, but I, like a, a keyword in there, but I am sort of like not entirely sure how that works. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, yeah, because I, th I think they're also using, give me one second, let me see. Um, I wonder if like you set the ID to regularization, like it just, it picks that up. Like if it's a default, um, regularize, uh, what was the name of the function? Regularization factor. Oh, no, no. Uh, the range is by default zero to one. Which I guess makes yeah. sense because I think every regularization parameter is always from zero to one. So it's like assuming that. So I think that's exactly what 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 it's doing. Um, but yeah, you can, I guess, overwrite it if you want like a regular tuning grid of things. Um, I think that's what you can do. But how it like how it knows that like the the zero to one gets plugged into here i am not exactly sure how it knows that because <laughs> um unless it's doing some like matching of like i um, think that the dials package knows about this engine specific parameters as well not just the more general ones yeah, uh, and that's my general sense of all of this is like all of these functions sort of like you can almost put in no parameter into any of these things and it just works. And it's because all of these things are so highly integrated that it's like there's a default already set up for you or there's like a way to figure out a default for you, like, like finalize, um, which is sort of like for me, it's adding to the confusion because it's like hiding a lot of stuff for you under the hood. But I guess if your main goal is like, I want to copy paste something and have it work, I guess it, it'll it work. Um, but yeah, I think that's sort of like, uh, for me, that's where a lot of the confusion lies is because it's like, it's so high level. It is like more <laughs> abstract without like literally like just 
what is the code actually doing? <laughs> but uh, it could, could could it be like a sort of a step normalized, bro, but not uh, as step normalized can be used. So you can use that to normalize the parameters because um, it's a regularization factor. So if you search for the function um, in the help, you find that the, the range is zero to one. And then there is this other- Yeah, uh, this is um, trans. Trans. Uh, trans, which- And, and so that is, is just, like, yeah. And it's like, um, I guess it stands for transformation. Yeah, no transformation. Um, I guess you can like log transform things like on the fly, which I'm not sure why you would want to do that there and and not in recipes. Uh, yeah, and not in recipes. Right. Um, maybe because when you then have uh, the wall uh, model set all um then you see that uh, beside the fact that the, here is the random for params the the book is talking about not the the updated param uh variable so he's saying that the random forest yes this random forest params yeah uh, oops, oops. can yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Updated. I sorry. So, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I I think that in, and even the penalty is a bit of like uh, a sort of uh, thing to see for uh, regularizations and some somehow because it's a transformation in scale, um, and then you can see the thing. But when you add the, the different steps, you do it for, for some reasons. And then you, when you finalize with the model, you realize, realize that if you want to plot it, for example, to, to have a visualization, it's better for you to have a, like a different range or a standardization um, um, uh, values or some uh, values that are standardized for you to uh, better visualize them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess. Um, but usually, I guess the other thing is like, I'm trying to think like, if, you, if you're worried about plotting something to visualize and keeping all of the scales like between the variables like comparable, like you would do that in recipes. Like you would literally like center scale them or scale them. Um, scale your variables. So like the interpretation of the model, you can actually plot them and they'll all be roughly on the same scale. Yeah, I don't know why you would do it here. Um, just reading um, the trains. Yeah, I, 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 I would. <laughs> yeah, you can pass on the scales objects like log 10 trends from skills package, but I don't know why you would. Yeah, I don't know why you would do it there other than like, um, so he's saying some tuning parameters are best associated with transformations and may, then maybe you realize at the end. And so it's like an updating fu uh, function. Like, yeah, I, I I wonder if it's like a, oh I made a mistake but I don't want it to, to go back and do everything and let me plug it in right there. I don't know if that's like the rationale. Um, might be useful. And I was yeah. wondering besides the fact this penalty, which is again, what if you if you have given some thought about the differences between packages with the same function, what's the difference, for example, with DL package and the finalized function and the other package? I, um, I think finalized comes from dials. So every time where we were typing finalized, it comes from dials. Uh, like this comes from dials. I don't think there's multiple 
finalize functions, if that's if that's your question. Yeah. Oh, just just see because if I um, write the question mark with finalize uh, and ask for help, it says which package do you want? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't actually, it's a lava with the other package for internal use. And then. Oh. Wait, what are these packages that you're getting finalized from? The app, the apps. Yeah. Yeah, it should just be in dials. Right. There's a finalized model in tune package, but that's not what we're after. There might be other packages that are completely different from the tidy models framework. Yeah. And if, if you have that that in that on your machine, then it might confuse those. Yeah, if you do question mark, question mark, uh, finalize, it'll show you all the packages that can get finalized from. So if you see something else, that might be it. Oh, oh I see. Yeah, you can get it from lava. <laughs> recipes juice um, yeah, i don't have anything on my machine that's but but the actual the like like this is what i see if i run that um yeah but i guess that's looking for just the word finalized and not like actual function finalized because the actual function that's named finalize is only in dials <laughs> I don't know, maybe she has a fun package that no one else has. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, when I end up programming in R, I, I double colon, like specify all my functions. Like it's just something what I, I've just gotten used to doing. Um, part of it is also like, um, I, I definitely know when I'm, whenever I have to use tidy models for like a small thing, I end up doing that because it's, it helps me like learn the ecosystem. Like I, I do it now instinctively for like tidy verse stuff, but it's also cause like I've used it for so much that like, I just have it all memorized now, but it was super useful when I was like learning it, like what's coming from Tibble and what's coming from tidy R like sometimes some of the data cleaning steps are like not in the library I loaded. <laughs> Because um, I, I typically also don't just library tidyverse, I just library them individually. And like, I, I know one of the functions that I use a lot is like row names to columns or something. And that comes from Tibble and not tidyr. And that's like something that always throws me off. Um, but it's, uh, and I think that's probably like what I am going to end up doing like with tidy models. Um, is just like double colon everything just to figure out like where things are coming from. Um, but yeah, there, there should only be, at least on my computer right now, there's only one function called finalize. And I guess in the context that we're talking about, it's only in dials um, and not from some other library. Um, but yeah, are. someone, yeah. but yeah, we're, we're, we're actually at time, but, uh, yeah, someone put together like a full blown workflow set example. <laughs> so we all have context, um, for all of this would be, would be super useful. You guys should all do sliced tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> it's hard to watch sliced cause they, they, they don't really like it's better if you just watch one person. <laughs> I mean, it, like I leave it on like while I'm doing work, but yeah, it's, it's, is it sliced on today? Oh no, it's tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I remember like Josiah using workflow sets really well. Um, yeah. And I guess like we should just, have that example just here <laughs> in the in the intro to the to the book just to um 
feel like the grid search will cover this, you know, the whole workflow set. Uh, Process, um, yeah, I, I I think it does, but um, I guess like my my thing is yeah, I know what you're saying though. Like a little more con, like I think I think because this is such a more intermediate or advanced level topic that you don't have to be as gentle, <laughs> like introducing things. I think it's totally okay to just be like, here's a bunch of stuff. You can read it if you want, and if you don't understand it, you can go to a, a chapter or this chapter. But I think it's useful to have like the whole like this isn't even like an example. Um, what am I showing that? Um, so this is using Tune Grid, which is what we want. But I guess like the tuning the grid with. Yeah, I guess like this example yeah. would be would be good to have at like the very beginning, right? Because I think Max is already having conversations about like, um, I think someone mentioned a couple of weeks ago about like putting workflow, workflow stuff like higher up towards the top because like no one really does this for single use cases. And it's like, yeah, you're probably going to jump into a workflow. Um, this is all set up for the basics. Yeah, but everyone ends up writing their code like this um, and not like, yeah, everyone ends up writing code in the workflow spec and not like the, the very simple like recipe style. Um, so something like this that's annotated, like this is part of that and this is part of that and this is part of that. I think like, yeah, if we look at this, this is probably much more helpful in terms of like um, how all the grid pieces combine together. So like we have all of the tune functions here. Uh, we're setting the mode, like we're using uh, regression, we're using the XG boost library. And then in here, um, hold on, tune grid. Uh, where's the workflow? Uh, XG boost workflow. Where is the tuning parameters? <laughs> They just didn't uh, specify any. Oh, grid. they just didn't specify anything. Yeah, so they just threw it in there, which I guess that works too. So this isn't actually a good example anyway. <laughs> but ideally, you use something that actually is using the the grid search in there, so it, like you can see how it plugs in, which is which I guess would plug in like right here. 